Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. <clears throat> I'm very, very touched by this. I, he's right. It's the first time I've ever had anything to do with the art world. Uh, and I'm really touched. I like it. <laughs> Although, actually, I must start by saying that when, when Hans Ulrich asked me to do this, I said no. I really couldn't see the point. I mean, I'm a journalist, I'm a political journalist, I steal from the art world, that's true, but I don't know very much about it. Uh, but what Hans Ulrich then said to me was that, I mean, and he knows about the art world, that there are a growing number of artists in uh, America, in Britain, who are concerned that mm, a lot of modern art is becoming separated from modern questions of politics and power at the very moment at which politics and power is, is becoming very, very interesting in both our countries, or, and throughout Europe as well. Um, and it would be good to engage in a dialogue, so I said yes, because you can't really argue no in the face of that. So I said yes. And I think to an extent, he is right. Certainly in my country, there is a growing separate... The, a, lot of, a lot of the art world has become embedded either in what's called the culture industries, or to an extent embedded in an even more strange bubble, which is property development. Uh, I don't know enough about here, but it's, it's become part of the property development world, a lot of art. Um, there is this disconnect between quite a lot of art and between politics and power, which is what interests me. Now, what I want to say, though, is that if, if, although there is a disconnect between politics and power in America and in the West, it isn't true everywhere. And what I want to do this evening, before we open it up for questions, is just tell a story about two men who I think, in the last 15, I mean, in, in the last 15 years, these two men took radical aesthetic ideas and used them to forge new, quite frightening, very powerful forms of new ideas of how to manipulate people and how to empower people. Uh, and I think it's a, it, I tell that story. It, it's, they're, they're radical concepts about how you inspire and manipulate the masses. Both these men came from Russia. You won't have heard of either of them. Well, I doubt it. That's slightly patronising. But I doubt if you would have heard about either of them. One is called Edward Limonov. Can we put up his picture? Edward Limonov uh, is seen by many political commentators who look at Russia as a really dangerous man. They see him as the leader of a new fascist movement in Russia um, who wants to re re give a rebirth of Russian nationalism. Um, what I want to argue and try and show you is that he's a far more interesting man than that and that actually far more complicated because his ideas go back to actually the punk ideas and the no-wave movement of the 1970s here in New York. This is him actually in New York in the 1970s wearing his Ramones t-shirt. Uh, the other... Is it in Paris? It's in Paris. Paris. Okay, it's in Paris. I'm lying. <laughs> you see, journalists always make things up, all right? It's a test. Now, the other man, and this is, this is really his name, is called Vladislav Serkov. Can we see him, please? Now, he, Vladislav Serkov, you will not have heard of, but he is one of the most powerful men in the world because he invented Putin's idea of how to manage democracy. He actually called it managed democracy. It's a fake democracy, which has allowed Putin to rule ruthlessly and the clique around him. And that is Putin, and that is Serkov. And Serkov is absolutely fascinating because he too took a radical, not, he didn't take conventional political ideas, he took radical aesthetic ideas born out of the same avant-garde movements that Limonov was part of and used them to create these movements. And I just want to tell you the story of these two men. <coughs> For one reason, because I think it gives an insight into what might happen both in America and in the West in the future to the politics of opposition. Because the conventional opposition, the conventional left in my country and I think here, has completely failed to really get any imaginative grip or purchase on the rolling economic crisis we're going through. And we're, and we're waiting for a new politics to come along, and I'm just trying to show you glimpses of what might be coming and the role that art might play in it, how it can get reconnected with politics in an imaginative way. Now, to understand the story of these two men, Zarkov and Limonov, you have to go back to the Russia of the 1980s, which is where they both came out of. It was the moment at which it was beginning to collapse. Now, 
at first sight, Russia in the 1980s and the West and America, America and the West today could not be more different. I mean, for one thing, they, they have no consumer goods. We've got lots. We've got, and also, waiting in the wings in the 1980s was Western capitalism, which is going to come in and fill that vacuum. But I want to suggest that there are actually unexpected parallels between that time and now here. What you had was an economic system which had once promised heaven on earth, which had gone into crisis. And not only that, but the elite who had created that system, the technocrats of that economic system, were now using, a tiny elite who designed the system, were now using that, that crisis, that growing absurdity of the system, to enrich themselves massively. They were actually pushing the absurdity of the economic system to siphon off money. The Russians called it the years of stagnation, and they called it that because although everyone knew the economic system wasn't quite working, no one could see an alternative. There was no political vision of an alternative. And I would suggest, gently, that despite all the differences, we are living now through our own years of stagnation here. And I think possibly this is something we can come back and talk about later on. But just to keep on with the story of these two men, I just want to first of all give you, I'm going to show a few bits of film. I'm going to, I, want to, I just want to give you a sense of those years of stagnation in the Soviet Union in the 1980s by showing you this one clip. It's got two bits in it. One is a BBC crew got in in 1984 undercover and just filmed that world. Uh, that, uh, it gives you a mood, sense of the mood. There was a wonderful woman doing the wallpaper in her flat and as she talks you, you get that sense that, of no one believing in anything anymore. Um, and also remember the other part of they were involved in a brutal and bitter war in Afghanistan, which everyone knew was completely pointless, yet no one knew how to stop. And I've just got another bit of the film from about 1985 of a woman who's giving a party as she sends off her son to fight in Afghanistan for two years. Could we just see the first clip, please? <coughs> Продолжение следует... 
Um, that gives you a sense of the mood of, of that time. Now, the crucial thing about it was precisely, precisely because the politicians had become captured by the elite who were deliberately making the system, criminally making the system absurd for their own benefit, young Russians, young, Soviet, young Soviets, turned against politics. They completely backed off from politics and they began to look for an alternative. And what they looked for again was in culture. Now this started back in the 70s, uh, and they turned to Western culture. I mean, they, they looked at culture as an alternative way. First of all, they did it in a really weird way. They went for conventional Western rock in a very strange way. And I just want to show you a clip, because I think it's a wonderful <coughs> fact. It, it, it's a forgotten character called Dean Reed. I, I doubt that anyone's heard of Dean Reed. But Dean Reed was a, a sing, singer from America, grew up in the Midwest, who, who went to Russia, or Soviet Union, and made himself a star by t turning himself into a copy of 1950s and 60s American music. Uh, he was like gigantic, enormous. Um, I just want to show you two, I just love him so much, I just want to show you two little clips <laughs> with one of his greatest fans. I mean, he was really, really big. One, the first half is just um, uh, him at his heyday in the, in the 70s. And the other is, in the 80s, as things started to go really badly wrong in the 70s, everyone realised he was a sort of a stupid puppet of the regime, and, the, and people began to go off him. And he, he, he even tries disco dancing to try and get back his thing. I just want to show you these two little bits. This is completely <laughs> indulgent. I'm just going to show them to you. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you for your love and friendship and for your tears. Be brave, was happy, was truthful, not daily. That's what he wrote to me when I was five. <laughs> he was carrying told me a lot about him because it was the multiplied Dean Reed who was of no need to anybody. He was just lonely. Uh, two weeks after that disco dancing, he killed himself. Yeah. He's a fascinating character. Um, but by that time, 1986, what was happening, what was becoming obvious in Russia was that it was uh, What's the word? It was becoming horrific. Not only was the system, the economic system, not working, but Afghanistan was becoming really bad. I mean, terrible things were happening. The, 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 the kids would come back, like that woman's uh, uh, the mother. Their children would come back in zinc coffins, and the, they literally dumped them on the flats at night because they were so, they, it was supposed to be secret that no one was being killed in Afghanistan. They just came and dumped them outside people's flats at night, often with the wrong body. It was becoming an absurd and horrific. Thing. Now, in the face of this, the mood of the generation who used to like Dean Reed became much more cynical, vicious, uh, what else, just like completely, totally disenchanted with politics. And what they did again was they, 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 they retreated even further into culture, but this time a much more radical underground culture, again taken from the West. And the key, well, one of the key ideologists in this was that guy I first showed you in Paris, called Edouard Limonov. Um, at that point, Limonov was a, uh, an avant-garde writer. He, he was an exile in America. Uh, he'd, he'd been expelled because he kept on beating people up in Moscow. Even the KGB got fed up with him, and they just sent him over to America. Um, 
he, beca he arrived in uh, New York in 1975, just as the punk scene in New York was taking off, and he became friends with, uh, I think, what's he called, Richard Hell, who was the in the band Television, uh, and Patti Smith and the Ramones. He was friends with all these people. Um, but what Limonov did was he took something, he did some more than that, he took punk, uh, which he said was best expressed in the idea of the blank generation, which I think is a Richard Hull song. Um, and he fused it with that powerful Soviet disillusion that was beginning to grow in his country. And he turned it into this idea that you could actually take culture and make it an alternative to politics because what it did, you could turn it so it actually expressed like a mirror the absurdity of the system that you were living under. And that generation got it. They got this idea that culture could be political without actually indulging in politics. You could retreat from politics, yet turn it around and, 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 and sort of push the absurdity back at the system and like a mirror. Um, and now, what's really interesting about him is that he, he was convinced, because when he lived in America, that actually the Western system was just as corrupt and undemocratic as the Russian was, the Russian one was. And he did this, uh, he wrote a novel in 1979, which became a, a really big hit on the, on the avant-garde underground, which is called It's Me, Eddie. Now, It's Me, Eddie is the story of his life in New York, or a character based on him. It's violent, pornographic, sadistic, and it's cold, clinical, and horrible, and it was a great success in 1979. Um, what he did is he was trying to show how power really affects people in a society like the West, as much as in Russia. His argument is that neither of them are democratic, and what he wanted to do was use a radical culture to try and show that. Now, Limonov's ideas had then had a big effect on that disaffected generation in Russia. Um, because what he did is he, is, is he sort of created the blank generation in Russia through his ideas. And it began to spread throughout the West. Uh, one of the really big movements behind it, I know this is very obscure, is the Siberian punk movement of the 1980s. <laughs> uh, it, uh, I'm going to come on to this in a minute because it's wonderful. I mean, they, they, very little of it remains. They used to pass it around on cassette tapes, uh, badly recorded in their bedrooms. Most of them have disappeared. You can get there's, there's the one or two guys on the internet who, who are trying to collect it all. Um, but the band that most expressed this, and who became very close to Limonov later, was this Siberian punk band, who are legendary in, in Russia. They're called Grazhadskaya Oberona, which means civil defense. They shortened the name to Grob, G-R-O-B, which means uh, tomb or grave. Now, Grob was led by this completely wonderful legendary man called Egor Letov. Can we just see him? No, that's him. Letov, uh, he, he, he was sent to psychiatric hospitals for a long time. He comes from Omsk, came from Omsk, he's now dead. Um, because he was so rebellious. Now, the music he created was far more interesting than Western punk. He was trying to do what Limonov was talking about, which is take the national folk culture of, of, of Russia and fuse it with a hard avant-garde noise. Um, it, 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 it's difficult to convey what Grob's concerts were like. I never went, but a journalist called Mark Ames, American journalist, who went there, has told me what they're like. He said, you've never seen anything like it in your life. It makes all the punk stuff in Britain and, and America just child's play. The, 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 military, the military used to attack them with tanks, tear gas, and armored personnel carry. And just as, as the band played, the, the, the punks just used to assault the troops. And it, it just became complete mayhem. Um, it's very difficult, I can't convey that to you. Um, it was what Limonov called it Russian maximalism, which is called taking everything to its extreme. I can't convey any of that to you. Uh, what I can do is play one of Rob's songs and just give you, try and give you a sense of that, that time. Um, uh, the, the growing dissolution, uh, the idea that Afghanistan was corrupt, that what was going on in Afghanistan was corrupting the, the Russian society at home. Um, the song that I then play is, is one of Grog's most famous songs. It's called Everything is Going to Plan. Um, and I followed it by a beautiful song by another member of the Siberian punk scene uh, called Yanka Dyagaleva, who was yet a letter, uh, Letos lover. Um, I've put the lyrics to Grog's song over the images so you can, you can see what he's talking about. Um, 
I haven't with her song. The only, you only need to know the main lyric to get what she's talking about. Uh, and I, I'm using a swear word here, but it's in the lyrics. The key, the key word, the key lyric is, the television is hanging from the ceiling, and no one knows how fucking low I'm feeling. Can we just play this? Can you put the phone on? took a generation with him, away from politics, completely. It, the politics became like nothing, and what they thought they were doing was creating a, a way of holding up the Soviet Union's absurdity to itself. Much more powerful than the punk movement here or, or in, in um, America, as uh, in, in England. What then happened though, <laughs> sorry, what then happened was that in the, 19, in the end of the 1980s and the early 1990s, the Soviet Union collapsed. Now, 
the, the problem for that counterculture generation was that if the system collapses and you have created a culture specifically designed to parody the absurdity of that system as a sort of political, anti-political gesture, what do you do? What are you left with? If the system's gone, what do you do? And this is, this is the key to this the story I'm telling you, because a number of people took different choices at that point. Some of them took very sad and personal choices. They committed suicide. Um, uh, that woman, Yanka Dergoleva, uh, she committed suicide. Two other leading members of the punk scene committed suicide. Others did as well. It, it's, a, it's, it's a completely fascinating story. But others went other ways. They, they took those ideas and they decided to try and use them to create a new kind of politics. Um, one of them was... Uh, now, what would then happen is that they'd go different ways. One of them was Limonov. Now, when the Soviet Union collapsed, Limonov had been allowed to come back from exile uh, to, to, to Moscow. And in 1992, he was completely shocked when he saw that how Yeltsin allowed American technocrats and bankers to come in and completely do what's called shock therapy. It was absolutely... Because it proved to Limonov. Remember, that he'd, he'd lived here in the 1970s. And in his novel, he had argued that basically Western democracy was as phony and as uh, brutal and absurd as the Soviet system. And when he came back and saw what was happening in shock therapy, he decided that proved that he was absolutely right. So what he set out to do was to create, try and create a new political movement to challenge this by fusing the ideas of individualism that he'd learned out of the punk movement, the modern ideology, with old ideas of Russian nationalism. And he created a party called the National Bolshevik Party. Um, now, the National Bolshevik Party almost immediately became the bete noir, the hate figure of many liberal commentators. They saw it as a dangerous new nationalism re-emerging in Russia, led by him. He was, I mean, like, Limonov became Dr. Evil. I mean, he, he was like, Everyone hated him. It's why we don't know much about him. I mean, in the BBC archives, there's nothing about him. He's not reported because he, is seen as, he was seen as so dangerous. Um, I want to go on and say that he's much more complicated than that, but what made it even worse was that in 1994, the BBC made a documentary about a guy called Radovan Karadzic, who was the extreme Serbian nationalist who was in charge of the siege, the siege of Sarajevo. Um, and they filmed the moment when Limonov came to visit Radovan Karadzic on the hillside above Sarajevo, before the siege of Sarajevo, when the snipers just, month after month, just used to pour their fire down into Sarajevo, the Serbian side of the snipers. They caught him, they filmed him visiting Karadzic, and Karadzic and him go up on the hillside, and it, Limonov is seen firing a very powerful sniper's rifle into Sarajevo or so the film seems to say. Limonov says he didn't. The director, who I know, says he did. Um, no one knows. I just thought I'd show you the clip, because it's, it's a very good piece of filmmaking, and it gives you a sense of Limonov as a, the weird person that he is. Just let's have a look at it. <laughs> The Turks uh, and even Muslims who have been previously Serbs and converted into Islam, they used to be in the centers of cities, uh, while Serbs uh, used to possess the entire ground, and uh, that was the real country when Turks came. We may be negotiating our territory, but we own this country. This is our country. Turks have been here occupiers, and Muslims are successors of those occupiers. So the traditional imposed geopolitics. Geopolitics, yes, exactly. <laughs> Sarajevo, the title 
was Sarajevo. And the first time was, I can hear disaster walking. City is burning out like a onion in the church. Yeah. as you see, with some very nasty people. Um, but he's far more complicated than that, because he's, he's really interesting. He's, he, what he's explicitly stated is that his idea is to take radical aesthetic ideas, both from the past, people like Mayakovsky, fascist uh, ideas, revolutionary Bolshevik ideas of, of, of art, and try and create a confrontational politics that breaks through what he sees as the fakeness of Western democracy that's being imposed on his country. And the way he says he's, I mean, I'm just going to quote what he says. Um, this is in a piece he wrote uh, quite, no, in, about five years ago. Um, loud, this, he describes the, the, the ideas behind his National Bolshevik Party. Loud denial of so-called values of civilization, grotesque trash screaming, some borrowings of rightist aesthetics were all common for New York City punk movements in the 1970s, as well as for the first National Bolsheviks in the 1990s. The newspaper of the party, Limonka, which is the, the name of a hand grenade, was in the 1990s the most radical and the most punkish of the whole world, with its slogans like, eat the rich, or a good bourgeois is a dead bourgeois, or capitalism is shit, or we, I mean, or capitalism is capitalism shit. We were in the punk tradition, what else were we? Uh, and you can see it. If we just put up here the, you, if you just show his, um, this is his symbol for his party. You can see how he is playing with both fascist aesthetics and uh, revolutionary le leftist aesthetics and that. Now, and also, practically everyone from the Siberian punk movement joined his party, including Mr. Letov. Uh, I think he was num he had his number four as his ticket. Um, it, it basically became the home to many members of that avant-garde revolutionary, uh, the avant-garde cultural movement, the eighties. Um, and together, they reached back into the past and borrowed, like Punk had done, as he points out, from fascist revolutionary aesthetics to invent a way of confronting the dullness and the sleepiness of contemporary culture. That was his idea, because he felt that we, in the West, live in a dream of democracy. He thinks it's as manipulated and as controlled as the Russia he grew up in in the 70s. And he, he was now seeing that happen in his country, and he wanted to use the aesthetic ideas that he got from the 80s to break through it. And that's, that's his idea behind the party. He also associates with very nasty people. But I'm just telling you about this. It's far more complicated. But the key thing is, and I think this is really interesting, is he's not trying to just go back to an old nationalism. He's trying to take the key ideology of our age, which is individualism. We all, we all believe in it. I want to be me. I want to have what I want. No one's going to tell me what to do. He's trying to take that, and that comes out of the punk movement in, in the 1970s, and fuse it with a, with a sort of a, 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 another force which people can come around to, gather around emotionally, which is nationalism, which we're very frightened of, because nationalism leads to all sorts of dangerous things. That's his idea, and he did, and liberals hate him, because he's just like fascist. But he's far more complicated than that, and he says that liberals are just dupes, 
because liberals believe that they are living in a free society. He says that's an illusion. These are the debates that go on there. Um, I'm just telling you about them. I don't judge it, I just think it's really interesting because he's trying to take politics and take aesthetics and radical cultural ideas and do things with them. Um, over the last 10 years or so, he's been very brave. I'm not trying to praise him, I'm not supporting him, but he, he and his members have done what he called, called intrusions, what do they call them? Revolutionary provocations, uh, which way before the Occupy movement, and a lot braver, given what he was facing under Putin's Russia. I just want to show you a bit of, of, of um, one of his demonstrations, him on his demonstration, then one of his revolutionary provocations, when they invade, I think they were invading the finance ministry in the heart of Moscow in 2006, which is a very great thing to do. Um, uh, what they're shouting is, return the money to the people, Putin must go. Um, and I've just included right at the end some members of the National Bolshevik Party, his party, in a cage, arrested after a provocation. And there's a little moment when you would just see, watch the guy's hand and what he does with it, and you will see exactly why liberals are so frightened of his party. Just go to see this clip. <laughs> the other man who took the other course, Vladislav Serkov, should we just see him again? Um, and what he did shows the other route that that generation who turned to radical culture and aesthetics took in the last 20 years. Now Serkov is half Russian, he's half Chechen. He's born in the provinces, but like all the others, he came to Moscow in the 1980s and became part of the avant-garde art scene there. Um, and in this case, and it's important, he became part of the radical theatre movement uh, in Moscow. Um, he'd been to drama school, but he was expelled for fighting. A lot of them seemed to fight. Um, Serkov is very, very shadowy and secretive. Um, but he has given a, a, an unusual window into his life and his ideas. Um, because in 2009, 
he wrote, allegedly, because it's under another name, but I think it's probably true, he published an autobiographical novel, which is called Almost Zero. It's under an assumed name. Um, it's a vicious, cynical setting, and it tells the story of a man called Agor, uh, a disillusioned youth who comes to Moscow in the 1980s, um, goes into the radical art scene, Agor can see through the fake ideology of the Soviet Union and becomes a hanger-on in that radical art movement, um, and goes into the theatre, then in the 1990s he becomes a very cynical PR man uh, uh, and who will promote anything for anyone. Uh, Agor is compared to Hamlet throughout the novel. Uh, he can see through the superficiality of his age, he's unable to have feelings about anything, um, in reality, it's just, I mean, it's a depiction of Surkov. In the 1990s, he went and worked for Mikhail Kodrakovsky, the uh, oligarch who's now in prison, and managed, once Kodrakovsky had been in prison, to switch to work for Putin. And Surkov is one of the main architects of Putin's rise to power from the end of the 90s onwards up to now. Um, he became a ruthless manipulator of the media. Now, what Surkov did was then turn Russian politics into a sort of postmodern theatre. This not only meant controlling the media, that's easy, which they did, but that's easy. He did something far more complicated. What he did is he created a political world where nothing, you don't know what's real and what's not real any longer. So what Surkov did, one example, allegedly, I have to say allegedly, is he, as he, he helped set up Putin's own party, United Russia, but he then set up lots of fake opposition parties to challenge their things, but they were really under his control, um, which he would then use to divert attention away from the real opposition. But that didn't stop them, because what then Sarkov would do was he would reveal they were fake, that he'd made the war, that, that they'd been created by the Kremlin. And he would then support genuine human rights groups to protest against that. I mean, he would just constantly claim. Um, he also then helped to create a copy of Limonov's party as a complete sort of neo-fascist group, which was, he partly did it to tease Limonov, I think, but it became this big, very big party called Nashi, um, which then also has a very dark, thuggish wing, who, the members of which would then go and beat up the human rights demonstrators that Surkov had just encouraged to go and demonstrate. So he, what he does is he plays these games all the time, in which it's all like a, a, a sort of a knowing theatre, um, whilst at the same time writing all sorts of stuff, criticising what he's doing, so in, in novel form. Um, he sits also, he sits in his office, writing essays on conceptual art, um, write, uh, listening to hip-hop, uh, and um, he also writes the lyrics for a, a big Russian rock group called Agati Christi, uh, which stands for Agatha Christi, which is um, And the lyrics satirize the corrupt and absurd world that he created. That's what he's like. Um, as a journalist who knows Serkov well, wrote about him, and it's a good quote, the novelist Edward Limonov describes Serkov himself as having turned Russia into a wonderful postmodern theatre where he experiments with uh, old and new political models. There is something in this. In contemporary Russia, the stage is constantly changing. The country is a dictatorship in the morning, a democracy at lunchtime, an oligarchy by supper time, while backstage oil companies are expropriated, journalists kill and billions siphoned away. Surkov is at the centre of the show, sponsoring nationalist skinheads one moment, backing human rights groups the next. It's a strategy of power based on keeping any opposition that there may be uh, constantly confused, a ceaseless shape-shifting that is unstoppable because it is indefinable. And what I'm saying is, just like Limonov, this isn't old, this is new. And this is a new kind of politics because it's, it's using the, that, that, those ideas that were born in the 1980s, that you could take radical cultural ideas and use it to parody the absurdity of politics. And that's what that is all about as well, just like Limonov is trying to do. Um, now, there's practically nothing of so in film. He just won't, he, he keeps himself hidden away. 
Um, I, I'm just going to show you a final clip, which is some of Nashi at their summer camp, and you will get a very good sense of what they're like, followed by a good piece by a BBC journalist called Tim Hewell, managed to grab him, grab him as he was go uh, sorry, just for a moment, as he was going to car, and you can see what he's like. Just have a look at this. ideologist-in-chief, the architect of the project for a new modern Russia, and he said to have promised the commissars, the country will be theirs. So Cox never agreed to an interview with Western TV, but Newsnight was determined to confront him. What pact has the Kremlin's grey cardinal made with Nashi? They are young people who consider themselves tomorrow's elite. Well, they are young, and so naturally they will receive the country. Who else should? You? He gets <laughs> weak. But hasn't he promised to make them the new elite? It's more they who consider themselves the new elite. And I don't think they're up to that task yet. A strange answer from the man who helped set up the movement and confers regularly with its leaders. I think both these men are interesting because they're moving into a world that we haven't got to yet. That's why I showed you this. I think what unites both those men is they both see Western ideas of democracy as a complete sham. Uh, that it is just as managed as anything else in Russia. That's what they both believe. They hate each other, by the way, but that's what they both believe. And they're trying to create a new kind of politics that challenges that fake idea of democracy which they feel has been imposed onto their country from the uh, early 90s or mid 90s onwards. Um, uh, they believe that we are dupes, that the management of democracy is much more cleverly hidden in our societies. I'm not saying I believe this, I'm just telling you why they're interesting, because they're trying to think through ways of breaking through the, the way we think. Um, the we, why they think we're dupes is because they think we have been possessed by the idea of individualism. That it's, that it's the, the sort of blinkered ideology of our time. That because all we think about is ourselves and our feelings and our diets and our bodies, that, that we have become imprisoned by our feelings. That it's not really a freedom, it's a cage. That if all, you're, if all you do is encourage to think about yourself, you are imprisoned by those feelings, you are narrow in your focus, and you are very weak because you can't join with anyone else. That's why they like nationalism, because you can join with people. Uh, it's why we're frightened, because it's dangerous. Um, they think we are powerless. That's, that's what unites those two men, and they want to, they're trying to find new ways of breaking through it, and they will use dangerous methods because danger is powerful in people's eyes. It's sort of, they're playing games which I don't think we've got anywhere near. I'm not saying they're good, I'm just saying they're really interesting. Um, they believe that the way to, the way to do that is, is not, to, not to go back to an old form of nationalism. Not, not, they're not interested in those sort of things. Well, they think that you can somehow fuse the ideology that we all believe in today 
individualism, me, with some other uh, grander forces that unite people behind an emotional idea. That's what they believe. They believe that the future of politics is somehow taking the way we think today and finding a way of linking it to something grander than ourselves that can give an emotional force and can link people together in a crowd. Now, Serkov does it, this guy, totally for personal power and for Putin's power. There's no other vision behind that. Limonov does it because he really wants to, to give power back to the people. I mean, he may have some very strange friends and he may not be a very nice man, but he genuinely is a sort of Bolshevik. He thinks power has been stolen from the people and he wants to give it back to them. And he says that the one, one of the ways it's stolen from us, or well, that's what he would say about us, is that we're encouraged just to believe it in ourselves. Therefore, we have no power in it. Now, I think that this is something that the opposition movements here and in Britain absolutely fail to engage with the idea. Because if you are going to take on power, if you want to take on power, you've got to find something more than just appealing to people's individuals. And I'm, ex I'm afraid I, I get into hot water when I do this, but I think this is the problem with things like the Occupy Movement, is that they are still possessed by the idea of individualism. Uh, I mean, I can only really speak for, for, in my own country, the Occupy Movement there. They are driven by an idea that somehow you can, everyone can join together, express their individual feelings, and somehow in almost a strange, magical way, an agreement will form where everyone goes like that, where everyone goes like that, and that's it. And I f think that it, that plays into the hands of the path because you're still keeping people as separate individuals and that somehow magically a, a new kind of order will come out of it. You can't challenge power like that. I mean, companies, modern tech companies, modern media companies, they get their power by assembling groups of people. They offer dreams. They offer you iPods that can assemble you as, as groups that they can not only make money out of, but by assembling you as groups, as collections of people, they become very powerful. I know this. I mean, I work in television. And those who run television will tell you quite honestly that the product is not the program. The product are the, is the audience. You assemble a group of people together and you sell it to the advertiser. And, and marketeers in television will tell you, oh, well, we can, yeah, it'll cost us two and a half million to move 2% from this channel to that channel. They're talking about people. I mean, they, they just, they think in terms of groups. That's how power works in society. That's how those in power maintain that power. And if you're going to challenge it, the only way to challenge those needs is to find a burning imaginative idea that can actually <coughs> unite people behind it and they can lose themselves in it. This is a very odd thing to say these days because we don't believe in losing ourselves in things. It's, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's an idea, it's what Limonov is on about. It's this idea that, uh, that um, he, he looks to nationalism. But it doesn't necessarily have to be nationalism. It's a sort of an emotional idea which unites people that they can lose themselves in, they can surrender themselves to, up to it, yet at the same time keep their sense of themselves as individuals and that they are in control of their own destiny and their own future and their own lives. That's the future of, of radical politics. The Occupy movement has, is nowhere near it because it hasn't got that idea. It, you cannot just create a burning political movement based on lots of individuals, big individuals, and either agreeing or not agreeing. It's got, you've got to allow people to surrender themselves emotionally to things. And I think that the future of any opposition politics, which I think those people are sort of trying to find their way towards, is to find a new imaginative idea that will allow people's hearts to leap and want to surrender themselves to it. And I think that's where art's going to come into it. I do think there is a disconnect between art and politics at the moment, between politics and power, about, between art and power. It's a really exciting thing, the idea of reuniting it. And I think that's where it's going to come from. It isn't going to come from conventional oppositional politics, and it would be good to discuss how art could do it. Thank you very much for listening to my work.